Hey, welcome back. Today we are going to uh, begin our look at drawing out the aggregate demand and aggregate supply model, which is the, uh, the graphical model we'll use to analyze the macroeconomy. And as part of that, we'll uh, look to try and explain this idea of equilibrium and learn how to draw and label the graph correctly. And then we'll focus in uh, more specifically on what's known as aggregate demand, and we'll talk about why it's downward sloping. And uh, we'll try and explain what causes a shift in the curve um, what causes the, the curve to actually move in the model. And so uh, all this information is going to be in your books in the chapter and page number indicated on the screen. First thing we want to do is look at the model. Um, the model is um, the aggregate demand and aggregate supply model and uh, we draw it as a regular graph and on the vertical axis we have the aggregate price level. So this is sort of the CPI, the measure of uh, the change in prices in the economy. Um, is there inflation or deflation? And then um, along the horizontal axis will be a measure of real GDP or what we call output. The aggregate demand curve um, is downward sloping and the aggregate demand curve basically um, measures the the overall demand in the economy for uh, goods given a different a, a given price level and then we have what's called the short run aggregate supply curve and we'll talk more about both of those curves a little later where those two curves intersect is what we call our point of equilibrium and at that point of equilibrium there is a certain price level p sub e and an output level y sub e and y here in this model indicates output so where they intersect is what we call equilibrium. That's the point at which the quantity of goods supplied in the economy is equal to the quantity of goods demanded in the economy. If the price level were to be below or above the equilibrium, then we have either shortages or surpluses. In this case, if the price level P1 is above the equilibrium point, we have what's known as a surplus. At this level P1, there is a certain amount of goods that is demanded by the economy and that is going to be uh, less than the amount that is being supplied by producers. That difference between those two points is called a surplus. And if the price level were to be below the equilibrium point, then the quantity supplied, Y sub 1 in this case, is going to be less than the quantity demanded by people in the economy and we have what's known as a shortage. The other thing we want to look at is the difference between what's called a movement and a shift in these curves. The intersection of these two points creates an equilibrium. An equilibrium stays where it's at unless one of these two curves changes or shifts. So in this example we have equilibrium point E1 at a price level P1 and output Y1. If for some reason uh, the aggregate demand curve were to shift to the right, that would create a new price level and output and that would be a shift in aggregate demand and when that curve shifts it moves the point of equilibrium along the short run aggregate supply curve to that new point E2. So when we talk about shifts and movements we're talking about um, identifying which curve is is actually changing that's the shift and when a curve shifts it creates a new equilibrium point that moves along the other curve. And so uh, a little bit later when we talk about um, uh, what causes a shift versus a movement, we'll say essentially that if the price level is changing, if we're going from P1 to P2, that would be an indication um, in this case that there's a movement along the supply curve that's caused by a shift in aggregate demand. When it comes to aggregate demand itself, we want to talk a little bit about what it is and what causes it to shift and what does it measure. Aggregate demand uh, is a, the aggregate demand curve is the combination of, of um, aggregate price level and output demanded at that price level. And so it's just a series of possible outcomes. If the price level, in this case, if the uh, average price level was 7.9, then we would demand 716 billion dollars in GDP. If the price level were 5.0, we would demand 950 billion dollars in GDP. So the, this line represents all the possible outcomes we could have depending on what the price level 
actually is in the economy. And we find that it is a downward sloping curve. And there are several reasons why the aggregate demand curve slopes downward. Basically what we're saying is that the aggregate demand curve goes uh, downwards in part because as price levels drop, the quantity demanded by the overall economy rises. And there are some reasons why. Uh, one is what we call the wealth effect. Essentially what it's saying is that lower prices makes you feel um, relatively wealthier. Um, your, your money has more purchasing power and so you're able to consume more goods. Another reason is that um, when there is lower price levels, there is a downward pressure on interest rates because people don't need to borrow as much money in order to purchase the same amount of goods they could before because goods are relatively less expensive. And so there, there's less competition for borrowing money. It causes the price of borrowing, which is called the interest rate, to drop. And we're going to talk more about the money market later in the year. But for right now, just um, understand that the interest rates will begin to drop. And as interest rates lower, it becomes less expensive for businesses to borrow um, for investment purposes and so we would see an increase in investment and um, that would lead to um, a, a, a greater level of output demanded with the lowering price level. And the third reason uh, is in part because as the price level drops the price of domestic goods becomes less expensive um, and so more people in the uh, domestic market are able to purchase domestic goods. They don't need to import as many goods um, as they might have before because now everything that's made in your country is less expensive and so uh, net exports begins to rise and that also means that with a lowering level of price level uh, lowering of the price levels there is an increase in the uh, quantity of goods demanded so all three of these different effects are are forcing the demand curve the aggregate demand curve to be downward sloping as price levels drop we see output begin to rise when it comes to the uh, the difference between a shift and a movement in the aggregate demand curve. It's important to remember that the aggregate demand curve, in essence, is the GDP formula. C plus I plus G plus X minus M. And so if any one of those changes, if any one increases, then that's going to be a shift in the aggregate demand curve. It's going to create a brand new set of coordinates between price level and output. And so if C goes up or I goes up or G goes up or net exports increases, then we say that the aggregate demand curve has shifted to the right. And if they go down, then we say aggregate demand has shifted to the left. If our C, I, G, and net exports don't change, um, then we say that there has been a movement along the demand curve, that if the price level changes, it's because the intersection point, the equilibrium point, has been uh, changed as a result of a shift in aggregate supply. And as a result, we're going to move along the, the, the aggregate demand curve to a new um, set of coordinates on the existing curve. And so anytime CIG or net exports changes, it's a brand new curve. If there's not a brand new curve, it means that if equilibrium is changing, that we're moving along the existing aggregate demand curve. When it comes to the causes of shifts in um, aggregate demand, there are several reasons uh, for that that we're going to look at. One is that there's a change in the expectations of consumers. Another is that there's a change in the overall wealth of consumers. We'll look at the effects of changes in the existing stock of capital, and we'll look at what's called fiscal policy and monetary policy. When it comes to expectations, um, if people expect a strong economy, then that has implications for their consumption patterns versus if they do not. And this is sort of what we talked about earlier in a previous lesson, that if you expect a strong economy, consumer spending will increase. It'll be more than what we um, would have done regardless of what the price level was. We're going to spend more with the expectation there's a stronger economy. There'll be more investment spending with the expectation of a stronger economy because there's going to be a, a greater need for, for more output. And so we would see then that if you expect a strong economy, consumption increases and we see a right shift in aggregate demand, whereas the opposite would be true if we expected a weak economy.
Changes in wealth have an effect as well. Um, an increase in my wealth increases my purchasing power, and if I have an increase in purchasing power, then I'm going to see a right shift in aggregate demand. If my wealth were to diminish for some reason, I'd see the opposite effect. Changes in physical capital have uh, an important role as well. If we're producing at or near capacity, then um, we're going to need to invest in new investment equipment or new uh, production equipment, which increases our investment spending. It doesn't matter what the price level is. We're going to need to be doing more investment spending because we're at that um, level of capacity. And that increase in I is going to cause a shift to the right in aggregate demand. Changes in government policy, known as fiscal policy, also have an effect on aggregate demand, and we're going to spend more time on fiscal policy later in the, in the uh, course. But for right now, um, fiscal policy, the definition is essentially any government spending or tax policy. So anything that affects how much the government spends or how much they're taxing the citizens falls under fiscal policy. And an, an increase in government spending is an increase in G. Um, which is one of the components of GDP. And so an increase in government spending would lead to an increase in aggregate demand, regardless of what the price level is. And, and another way of saying that is to say that aggregate demand will shift to the right. If government were to cut spending, it would shift to the left. And when it comes to taxes, if the government were to increase their taxes on citizens, that would reduce the amount of money available to citizens for consumption. And so C would actually re be reduced. So in the case of taxes, if they increase taxes through fiscal policy, the government does that, then consumption would actually shrink. And we would see a rise in taxes causing a left shift in aggregate demand. And if the government were to cut taxes, there'd be more money left over for consumption, and people would consume more, and aggregate demand would actually shift to the right. There's one more type of policy, and that's called monetary policy. And monetary policy is managed by the Federal Reserve, which we'll talk about later in the, in the course. But for right now, what you need to understand is that monetary policy is about determining how much money is available in the economy. And if the Federal Reserve were to increase the amount of money supply or money in the market, um, that generally means that there's more money available to be lent through the banking system. And if there's more money to be lent in the banking system, if the supply increases, what we find is that it reduces the price pressure of borrowing and causes interest rates to drop. When interest rates drop, we find then that consumption and investment becomes less expensive than it was before, which should cause an increase in both of those components of GDP. If and when investment and or consumption spending increases, we see a right shift in aggregate demand. If the Federal Reserve were to reduce the amount of money available, it would actually drive interest rates up, reducing the amount of investment in consumer spending and causing aggregate demand to shift to the left. We're going to do some more practice on aggregate demand and some of the basics of the model in class. We'll look at aggregate supply next time, and we'll look at some more examples of equilibrium and how it can change in the, uh, the class after that. Look forward to seeing you then. Bye.